young people have a restless quest for purpose. And it's government's duties to give them platforms where they can discover their purpose. The internet offers users a daunting array of information. Artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, facial recognition, voice recognition. All these things are now going to be a reality. Do you remember the old days of the internet? For me, that's grad student time. I tried to push that out of my mind, but there were a lot of promises back then. Disruptors would cut out the middleman, competition would flourish, and social media would be the great democratizer. How quaint making authorities more accountable to their people and especially their youths, you know, the youths. So how'd all that turn out? I'll dig into it and then sit down with a woman on the government side of that divide. Emirati Youth Minister Shama Al-Mazri is here and at 22 years old, 22, she became the world's youngest government minister in a region whose population is quickly becoming younger and more engaged online. Though you should see the painting they have in the attic. Not good. Then of course, I've got your puppet regime. This new Congress is making things really terrible for me. But first, a word from the folks who help us keep the lights on. Either this is the first Arab revolution of the 21st century, or it will be brutally suppressed. Our politicians are more beholden to these institutions than to the people they're supposed to represent. It was an age of revolution. The death of a Tunisian fruit vendor in 2010 sparked nationwide protests that ousted a president. And as momentum grew, fed by cell phone video and social media uprisings across the Middle East, brought us this. Back then, the internet seemed like a tool of liberation. I don't know if you remember this New Yorker cartoon with the dog looking on the computer, and he said, on the internet, no one knows if you're a dog. That was 25 years ago. Today, everyone knows if you're a dog on the internet. They know what kind of dogs you're into. They know where you do your doggy business. It's a very different internet. Today, it's more about control, the prerogative of big business and big government. Think artificial intelligence, big data, and ultra-fast networks. Smartphones in every young person's hands is no longer just a vehicle for popular change. It's a way of putting users onto the grid and productizing them. But here's the thing. Programmers don't have your best interest at heart, so you might want to think twice about handing over your data so willingly. Sure, Facebook's 10-year challenge just might be a harmless meme. No, who are you kidding? There's a pretty good chance it's improving facial recognition algorithms for Facebook. Otherwise, those people should be fired. Google's decision to photograph every street on the planet might help you find that out-of-the-way restaurant. But did they ask permission to photograph your house or your child's school? That's just creepy. The age of revolution has evolved into an age of surveillance. You and I are the new raw materials to be mined. And a new tech cold war is emerging. Let's look at China and the United States. Both countries' tech giants are speeding to master AI, supercomputing, and the 5G. Even better than the 4G. The winner could dominate the coming decades economically and geopolitically. The US still has the best talent. That's right. That's right. You know. But Beijing has more data, and they're training many more technologists. The stakes are that high. Meanwhile, China has used its rapid growth to emerge as the world's biggest market for surveillance technology, using millions of cameras and billions of lines of code to keep tabs on its citizens. Those actions have not gone unnoticed. Others have joined in. In the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Syria, to name just three, all are investing big on internet surveillance in the name of security. And users who tweet and snap and share simultaneously certainly make things easier. The youth who use the internets to fill the streets back in the days of the Arab Spring are today giving authorities just what they need to stay in power. Thing is, the youth can't be ignored. And that brings us to today's guest. The 
me, the Legion is a hub for youthful energy and positive energy. And it's truly an honor to stand before you and beside you. Thank you for four amazing years I spent here as a student. And I'm here with Her Excellency Shama al Mazuri the Minister of State for Youth Affairs in the UAE. Wonderful to be with you again, Shah. We're so delighted to see you again. So you're in a very young society. Even in that context, you're on the young side of that. Why don't you start by just telling me how it feels to be minister with portfolio as when you started a 22-year-old? When I, when I think of my role, I think of myself as a designer. And I'll tell you how, I play a dual role. So I'm a government official, but I'm also a young person. And as a government official, I create kind of services for youth. But as a young person, I'm the end user. And I think this gives us tremendous value in my job because my life as a young person informs the service I give. If you think of tech savvy companies, they design products not for what they think young people or people want. They design a product that the end user needs, and they have fast cycle iterations, et cetera. When you're a policymaker and kind of in a designer mindset, you are sitting in the shoes of the end user. And I think this is something very special that the UAE has done. It's not just me, but also everyone in the Office of Ministry of Youth is a young person. Um, how is life different for an Emirati, a young person today, than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago? So you mean 10 years ago, 20 years ago, our parents' lives were Yeah, parents. absolutely. So I think the major change is that our world has changed. Our young people today are trying to build a world that is more inclusive, that is more tolerant, and, and making sure that this world works for us. Maybe when we look at our parents and our grandparents and the founding fathers of the UAE, the UAE is less than 47 years old. They were trying to build a nation where seven emirates were unified. And, and, and you look at the two yeah, the worlds. Country. Your country, the country is less than 50 years old. Yes. So your parents and your grandparents were building a country. Exactly. The and country I, is now there. Exactly. What I think is interesting to look at is back then, 50 years of, or 50 years of our nations right now is built by oil. The, the big question is what will our next 50 years be built on? So the challenge young people face is how do we transform our UAE oil-based economy into a knowledge-based economy? And to be honest, the answer to that is very interesting because it involves young people. How do I, maybe my role or my success rate is how do I make sure young people's ideas and talents freely flow to solve challenges to move to a knowledge-based economy? Now, you have the good fortune of being in a very wealthy country and it's not all that big, it makes it easier to manage, but what do the young people want that they're not getting today? Where, where do you see dissatisfactions that need to be addressed in your country? You might know that the majority of young people in the UAE go to the public sector. For, for stability, security, they prefer public sector jobs. But True that, across that, most of the Gulf, Yes, actually. the Gulf. Yes. And this has caused kind of this... They're also higher prestige yes. in the way they're perceived. Exactly. Maybe and we don't have to work quite as hard. It, no, I think I'm not work talking is about hard. you, but the general perception. <laughs> general perception, yes, is and that? especially longer working hours in the private sector, et cetera. I think it's a general perception. Yes. But so what are we trying to do about this? We did surveys on entrepreneurship, and we want to encourage young people to be entrepreneurs. We realized that 55% of our youth want to be entrepreneurs, but there were big hurdles that they faced. Some were kind of getting financing. So what we did was we worked with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Economy and the Central Bank to try to find what policies can we do to change the lives of young people who want to be entrepreneurs. So if you look at every- And is that happening? Yes, that's happening right now. Give me and a figure that proves that. Can you give me, do you have a data So point? now, yes, so 30% mm -hmm. of a government, uh, government procurement must come from these SMEs. Uh, in all fields? All governments, federal the, and local. And, and all, all yeah. fields. So that certainly is a boost. That's a boost. For smaller and we're excited companies. To, exactly. So there isn't a ministry for old people in the UAE. No. Because they're just going to die soon anyway. <sighs> it's okay. I mean, you can say it. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, we're focusing on the youth people and the youth for our demographic anyway. I the puppets, think, you know, it's fine. I think the UAE looks at, look, 50% of our population are youth. If we invest in them, that's 100% of our tomorrow. Very good. Um, when you think outside of the UAE, mm. Who's getting it right for the young people right now? I, I, I'm not gonna say there's one country that gets it right, but when you look at the youth field- Who inspires you? There's so many. I think our leadership inspires me. Outside of your country. 
Prime Minister Justin Trudeau yes. in the youth field. I think they're walking the talk with youth. How so? Um, they have a youth council, but they're also working on trying to create something like an, a kind of national service where on your CV for one year, they're still figuring it out, but they haven't implemented it. But basically every youth has to serve their nation somehow. I could be a nurse in a hospital, I could teach. And I think this is fun because we realize that young people have a restless quest for purpose. And it's government's duties to give them platforms where they can discover their purpose. When you think of young people in the Middle East, I think the first thing that comes to everyone is Arab Spring. And I think the Arab Spring showed the world, not just the MENA region, that youth have an important voice, but also that governments must be connected to their young people. It's not an easy task, and I'll compare and tell you what the UAE did. The MENA region, more than 60% of their population are youth. That's a tremendous volume. Youth under 35. Under 35. Under 35, yes. And what's happening is some governments are still hesitant to engage with their youth. And you can see it around the world, not just in the MENA region, but, but specifically the MENA region with this youth bulge that sometimes they see as, as a challenge, the UAE sees it as an opportunity. And I think some governments see, okay, 20% plus unemployment in the MENA region. That's a dangerous constant that hasn't moved. Job quality or job quality is, is a challenge. Education is a challenge around the MENA region. And I think a lot of governments still think, Wow, how do we even solve this? And they're hesitant. I come from a nation where we're never hesitant. They take big risks and big bets on youth. Now, you know, it's absolutely true that when you think about the Arab Spring and you see the people that were on the street in Tunisia and in Egypt, for example, I mean, they were mostly young people and they were empowered by technologies. To what extent do you see a desire for that kind of change in your country? In other words, change that's faster than what the government could possibly withstand. We come from a nation that's very will-powered. We don't only focus on, maybe you, when you think of the UAE, you think oil and trade or cutting edge infrastructure. We have cutting edge youth, youth development. Women, I think the UAE is, is, the, is one of the nations in the MENA region that has a law and a decree where women have to be in boardrooms. We have the first gender balance council in the region. We have the first female uh, speaker of parliament. There's a, uh, when you say in boardrooms, there's a quota yes. uh, for women on all boards. Yes. And it's, and it's, it's enforced. Mm -hmm. If you look at education, 56% of graduates in STEM are female. Um, if you look at the workforce, 60% of government officials in, sorry, in federal government are female and 30% of them are in, are in leadership positions. So it's not just on youth, but also on women we're moving the dial. And I think it's a, com it's a country that wants to keep raising the bar and be competitive. Can fresh insight from young people also help to resolve some of these horrible conflicts in the region? I mean, such a big fight now between, you know, the Emiratis, the Saudis, and Iran. Um, if you look at Yemen, I think all of us are concerned about the ongoing crisis in Yemen. And we all want to make sure that there's a legitimate government in, in, in Yemen that can help good people go to work. We don't want a lost generation in Yemen. And yet today, I mean, the UN still refers to Yemen as the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Yeah. And I think it, it concerns us all because we, we want to make sure that we don't lose this generation, especially this young generation. We're part of a globalized world, and if they don't have hope, if, and if you don't see your young people as assets, hopelessness results. Now, I want to ask about you a little bit. You're 25 years old, and you're a member of cabinet. What kind of pressure does that put on you for the next thing you're going to do? I think I always, well, I'm always under kind of pressure, but it, it's good for me. That's how kind of I run. It makes my adrenaline run. It makes me, and, and, and we have a leadership that when you achieve something, that's not enough. You have to think of the next big achievement. People around and the world are gonna see you and they're gonna see this inspirational figure that is their age and say, aha, like I relate to that person, right? So what do you think about your future career? What are some things that excite you? Some things that you think I might wanna do over the course of what's gonna be a pretty long life? I think uh, there's so, uh, being, it's my, it's, it's my first role in government and right. public service. And it opened so many doors for me to understand what are the key issues around the world or even in our nation that we can help solve. But most importantly, I think as a person, it gave me the courage that young people can do it. And anyone who says young people are unfinished adults has kind of a different 
view because we did it in the UAE and it's been successful. What's the skill set that you don't have yet uh, that you would really like to have or develop, let's say in the next five or 10 years? There's so much, oh my God, I wanna do so well, much. start with a big one, give a skill set. Skill set, yeah, so yeah. Um, I want to, uh, I wanna get more uh, knowledge, theory and practice in uh, research and, and collecting quantitative data. I'm very interested in that aspect. It's related to the field puzzle, but also in general. Um, I'm interested in learning another language. Um, I'm interested Any in- Any particular one? No, I've, I, I know Chinese and I know French um, and Arabic and English, but I, I wanted another, I think Russian. You gotta do five. A four is really Russian. inadequate for a 25 year old, I think. <laughs> Russian, I think, is interesting. Если хочешь практика, пожалуйста. Go ahead. Um, my brother speaks Russian, so I, I wanna learn Russian. And my dad, he speaks Russian. Um, really, four, four fluent languages? Is yeah. that true? Do you speak Chinese? No. No, I just speak oh. Russian. Oh, okay. A little French, but my Russian's actually good. Huh? So it sounds amazing. Right my no. dad speaks Russian. Why? Why does he speak uh, Russian? He studied in Russia. Yeah? Yeah. Are you having fun? Are you taking time for yourself, for your friends, right? I mean, you know, I, I remember as a 15-year-old in college, I, you, sometimes when you accomplish a lot at a young age, you're not breathing. Are you yes. breathing? So I'll tell you, I started breathing two years ago. Not my first year. At the ripe I was, old age of yeah. 23. I, yes. 22, you didn't breathe at 22. 22 was, I think, when you first come into a new position and you're a new employee. I yeah. was like, it's embarrassing to even request one day off. It's your first year. Um, what was your epiphany? What, what suddenly, how'd you make that change? I think um, after one year and understanding kind of your job and your role and your mandate and responsibility and also growing and developing a team and building the capabilities of your team, I was able to realize, you know what, I think rest is like a pause and a stop that will help me restart. So I took three, four days off and it was like, for me, I've never taken a holiday where I paused completely. I was a student when I was at Oxford or even at NYU. Um, it was focus, focus, focus and, and the learning as much as I can. And so that holiday was like, an epiphany, it was like, wow, that's why people take holidays. It was remarkable to really kind of discover how sometimes when you rest, it helps you come back with so much energy and focus and you, you see your work in a different light. It's like a new dawn and you take a new road. What were you doing? Where were you? No, I was planet? a professor at Stanford. I started teaching at 24. I didn't want to, I got my PhD at 24. And my advisor said, um, I wanted to go and leave and come to New York and get a job because I'd never had a job. I never had a job. You had a, two yeah. jobs already. I never, had, I never worked for anyone. So, you know, you go to school, undergrad, master's, PhD, straight, I'm ready to have a job. He said, no, I want you to be a professor. You're going to stay here at Stanford. I said, no. So he called my mother and he said I was crazy and that I was not going to accept this position. So everyone convinced me to take the job. So I took the job. So I'm 24. I'm teaching at Stanford and I hate it because I have no experience. I have nothing to teach. Like, I'm funny, mm -hmm. but it's not useful. So I quit after two years, because you can't quit before two years, because that's yeah. two, that you feel like you hadn't tried it. And then I came here, and then I started the company. I think so, when you live in New York, you can't live anywhere else, right? Uh, completely, yeah. I don't even like, I, I mean, I'm from Boston, so. I don't even like New York. And then as soon as I moved here, I'm like, I'm never moving. Yeah, so, no, yeah. I love New York, I yeah. miss it, it was nice. So, the United States is still the world's largest economy. You come here a fair amount. If you had, Anything, any advice, when you see our government, when you see youth in the United States, what would you like to see us do differently? I would love for a lot of youth in the United States to connect with other youth around the world. You don't think we do that? Maybe not enough. I think I've lived in, I've lived in New York a bit and in DC, um, and I went to other parts, and I feel like a lot of my American friends don't know about other nations. Some do, those who come and study abroad, but who have the luxury of doing it, but others don't. And I think sometimes they look at the news and they're shocked. Her Excellency, Shama al Mazuri. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure.
John Piper, and I was wondering what can be done about the Muslim genocide in China right now? Well, Piper, I, I don't know that you would call it a Muslim genocide in the sense that the Chinese are not trying to eradicate uh, the Uyghur Muslims uh, from China, uh, but they are certainly do everything they can um, to integrate them into a Chinese top-down system. And for those that don't like it, they are being forcibly re-educated. Uh, put into camps, uh, forced to attend programs, and culturally assimilated against their will. Over a million attending such re-education classes right now. It is a massive violation of their human rights, something the international community is talking a lot about, but with the Chinese writing the big checks for everyone and people worry that their economy is starting to slow down and they're the biggest driver, their growth, in the global economy right now, um, it's hard to know what can truly be done about it? I guess I would say speak out a lot more loudly, um, but that didn't stop the harsh crackdowns after Tiananmen Square back in 1989. And I don't suspect that anything that the Western leaders are going to do right now is going to stop the extraordinary mistreatment of Muslims in China today. Hi, my name is Zachary, and my question is, what does the U.S.'s withdrawal from Syria mean for the Syrian people? Uh, Zach, the U.S. withdrawal from Syria uh, means that the American people are not very committed to the Syrian people, but that was true before the U.S. withdrew from Syria. Uh, you realize that a country of some 23 million people, we've had half, 11.6 million displaced, over 5 million refugees leaving the country completely, and about 600,000 dead. Uh, that happened irrespective of a U.S. withdrawal. Uh, the, the people on the ground, other than Syrians, are Russians, Iranians, and Turks. Those are the countries that are next door, nearby, have a military base, really care for their own national security about what happens in Syria. The United States, we actually send more humanitarian aid than any other country. It's not like we do nothing, but we weren't prepared to fight. Uh, for these people, and we certainly weren't prepared to take a lot of them in. So as a consequence, I guess I would say American withdrawal means that we are publicly admitting what we all sort of privately knew uh, over the past several years. Now, for something completely different, even though we bring it to you every single week, I have for you, ladies and gentlemen, your puppet regime. John. This new Congress is making things really terrible for me. Well, sir, Congress is a needless constraint on American power. I think it's time we write a love letter back to our friend Kim Jong-un. Give me a pen. I'm sorry, sir, there are no pens. What? Why not? They're all under investigation by the House of Representatives. What? Already? Ugh, fine, then give me a laptop. I can't do that, sir. Every laptop and computer in the building is also under investigation. What, like there's emails on them? Fine, give me a thumbtack. I'll scratch the letter and All our thumbtacks are under... Si Can we bomb Iran, sir, please? Damn it, John, is there anything in this building that is not under investigation? Well, we still have your television. Oh, good. That's the most trusted advisor in my administration anyway. Alexa, turn on the TV. It's a new morning in America and our Trump investigations have begun. We're looking at everything he has ever said, done, touched, assaulted, insulted, coughed on, looked at, sat next to, slept with, mentioned, or retweeted. Madam Speaker, with all these investigations, would the Democrats have time to write meaningful climate legislation or an infrastructure bill? <laughs> It's like you think we're as organized as the Republicans. No, our main infrastructure concern is where to store all the paperwork related to these investigations. <laughs> Call the Democrats. I have an idea. Hi, folks. Ian here. We're live at the southern border of the United States, where President Trump has just struck a remarkable deal on border security. I told you I would build a wall and that someone was going to pay for it. That's right. We have agreed with the president that we will house all Trump investigation files in 1,000 miles of artistically designed steel filing cabinets along the border. You see, as I predicted, all the Democrats wanted was a steel wall and a... Puppet regime! And that is our show this week. We'll be back next week. Don't miss it. Don't miss the show. Don't miss me. I mean, you can miss me a little. You, you can miss me for the next week. You can, but don't miss the show. In the meantime, if you like what you've seen, check us out 
on gzeromedia.com.